If you have a high fasting insulin, if you have excess abdominal fat, if you have high blood pressure, high triglycerides, low HDL, low energy, frequent carb cravings, those are all signs of insulin resistance. Insulin and inflammation are hand in hand. We can't lower insulin resistance if we're not also lowering inflammation. Figure out how to fuel your body before you fast because the fasting, it's just a quick fix tool again. And when you stop fasting, the weight is gonna come back on. Insulin resistance is a devastating disease that can be prevented and it can be reversed, but you have to have the right information. If you have been just diluted by this eat less, exercise more notion, and you've lost the same 20 pounds five times in your life on various diets, just know that there's hope. And when you understand how to eat to keep insulin low instead of how to eat to keep calories low, the door is open. So to kick off, to get us all on the same page to start, I think a good place is to talk about what insulin is and why controlling it is so critical if we want to prevent chronic disease. Yeah, well, Jesse, I think it's really, as you said, important to understand insulin and that it's not the bad guy. Like insulin is a hormone made in your pancreas that is vital for our survival. And the classic example of that is somebody with type 1 diabetes who doesn't make insulin. That disease was known as the wasting disease because when you don't have insulin, the nutrients that you eat, specifically glucose, can't get into your cells. And so even though you have an abundance of nutrients available, you're just getting rid of all of it through uh, urine because your cells are starving, so they waste away. So the role of insulin is really multifactorial in the body, but the one I focus on is fat creation and storage. So I call insulin your fat creation and storage hormone. The more you have it, likely the more fat you will store, the, the more fat you're going to create. And so it makes sense if you want to lose fat, we need to lower insulin levels. So that's what insulin does in a nutshell is it helps maintain your blood sugar levels and maintain your fat stores in your body. And the reason it's really important to control over the long haul is because insulin in excess is inflammatory. And we know that inflammation and excess insulin is the root cause of so many chronic diseases. And as a geriatric physical therapist, it did not take me long to put this insulin resistance puzzle together. I never just had someone with diabetes. I never just had someone with heart disease. And I never just had somebody with cognitive impairment. If you look at their H&P, their history and physical, you're going to see polypharmacy, meaning they're on multiple medications for things like high blood sugar, high blood pressure, and altered cholesterol. And I thought, okay, these are a cluster of symptoms. There must be a common denominator here. And that common denominator was insulin. So if you think of it as a tree, you know, the tree has many branches and many leaves, but it has one root system. And that root system for disease is insulin resistance and how it manifests into things like heart, manifests into heart disease or PCOS or erectile dysfunction or vascular dementia you know, or diabetes or obesity, a lot of that is dependent upon other lifestyle factors and genetic factors. So, you know, your genetics might load the gun, so to speak, but your, your lifestyle is what pulls the trigger. So high levels of insulin are dangerous and your genetics and your lifestyle will determine what dangers, you know, are on your road essentially. All right. A lot there we can unpack, but I think it's important again to set the scene here to talk about the different areas, things we're doing in our life these days to raise insulin. And I know dietary is a big piece. We're going to cover that extensively, but let's talk about the other factors people might not be thinking about. This is so important. And you've done such a nice job covering insulin resistance on your podcast. And I was listening to some of those episodes and I was trying to find the gaps in the content so far. And I think one of them would be stress and sleep. So the way that I like to explain a low insulin and inflammation lifestyle is that there's four pillars. There's nutrition, which includes what you eat and when you eat. So like time-restricted feeding or intermittent fasting, I'm sure we're going to get into that today. There's how you move. Um, the whole notion that calories in, calories out is what matters, like that is not true. Different types of movement have different benefits, right? So we really want to focus on two forms of activity. 
There's more than that, but from an insulin standpoint, keeping insulin low, we want to focus on stress relieving activities. So like gentle walking, yoga, light running, whatever reduces cortisol, and then strengthening activities because muscle is a huge reservoir reservoir for where glucose goes after a meal. So the more muscle mass we have, the better insulin sensitivity we can have. So movement is really important as well. Sleep is so important for many reasons, but a big thing that people don't appreciate is the impact that poor sleep has on your stress hormones, so cortisol, and has on your appetite hormones, specifically ghrelin and leptin. So when you're sleep deprived, you're going to be way more likely to overeat. Your willpower is not recharged. And so when we're talking about insulin resistance, we have to talk about eating patterns. And you can't talk about eating patterns without appreciating the role that good sleep plays in a healthy metabolism and a healthy appetite. And then the last part that kind of dovetails off of that is stress. So often I see women and they're like, I'm eating healthy and I'm exercising and I'm not losing weight. I said, well, what's your stress management like? And they're like, crummy. (laughs) I'm really stressed out. I said, well, that could be why. Because when you're stressed, you release a hormone called cortisol. As I'm sure you know, cortisol will raise your blood glucose levels. And when your blood glucose levels rise, your blood insulin levels must rise because there's only two ways that that glucose can get into your cells to be used or stored for energy. The first is insulin. Remember, insulin acts as kind of that key that unlocks the cell to let glucose in. And this is through, um, it's called the GLUT4 transporter. So the GLUT4 transporter sits inside the cell, comes to the cell membrane like a little tube slide. And when insulin binds to its receptor, that can happen and glucose can slide in. The other mechanism is exercise. Muscle demand can move those GLUT4 transporters to the cell membrane. So if you're stressed out, your glucose is going up and your insulin is going up and it's just, you know, you're just going to go up and up and up unless you're moving your body to relieve that stress, which is why we go back to stress management with exercise. So nutrition, what you're eating and when you're eating, right? Physical activity, focusing on strength training and stress reduction activities. Quality sleep, seven to nine hours a night is ideal. And then stress management. And we can talk so much about that. Um, I run a coaching program and 90% of our conversation is around mindset, which has everything to do with stress management. Because if you're stressed, you're not going to be implementing the long-term behavior changes necessary to keep that insulin low. So we can't, we really can't talk about strategy without also talking about the mindset side of behavior change. All right. A lot there. And you touched on this. And I noticed as you're sharing all that, there is this connection between the different pillars you shared. And one of the connections I noticed is the stress piece where this is one of the pillars we need to control in and of itself, but also it overlaps with exercise and sleep. And I think it was all tied in with cortisol. So we do have these separate pillars, but there are these connections between, and I just wanted to appreciate that. Yep. Everything is connected. And that's, I think one of the the flaws in our current Western medicine system <clears throat> is that people practice in silos. You go to your endocrinologist for your diabetes. You go to your cardiologist for your heart issues. You go to a joint doctor uh, for your joint pain. And I think that when we start to appreciate that everything is connected, we can have that honest conversation about, hey, lifestyle matters. Your lifestyle and living a low insulin and inflammation lifestyle is the single like the single biggest thing that you can do to reduce your risk for all of the, these diseases, all of these medical appointments, all of these medications and tons and tons of money spent on preventable conditions. If you're enjoying the episode, take a second and let me know by clicking like and subscribe below. Thank you so much and now back to the episode. So when you're working with somebody And you can see, and I'm sure for most of us, this is an area, it's a continuum and we can all improve in different ways. But what I'm getting at with this is because we've shared so many different inputs that affect insulin, for somebody that wants to begin this journey and take hold and control insulin in a better way, where do they begin? Or does it depend on the person? 
Well, I think it always depends on the person, but we have something called a Zivli habit hierarchy. Um, and for people who are like, what is Zivli? It's a word I made up, completely made up. Uh, but Ziv does mean live in Croatian, so to live. And then the LI stands for low insulin and low inflammation lifestyle. So Zivli, to live a low insulin and inflammation lifestyle. And we have what's called our Zivli habit hierarchy. And I created this because I think a lot of people, when they then when they start this new goal, oh, I'm going to lose 10 pounds, or I'm going to lose 20 pounds, or I'm going to lower my blood sugar, they automatically go to diet and exercise. And they throw spaghetti at the wall and they hope something sticks, where they try to reduce their calories or their portion sizes, or I'm just going to go to the gym for half an hour a day every day. And they try maybe what's worked in the past. And what's worked in the past isn't working anymore. This is especially true for postmenopausal women. And so when we're talking about anything related to behavior change, we have to start with mindset. And so I really think that everybody should start with a firm understanding of what's called auto-suggestion, which is suggesting things to your brain, creating the reality that you want. And so that involves creating the picture that you want. So why do you want to lose the 20 pounds? Why do you want to lower your blood sugar? And then most people can tell me what they don't want. Well, I don't want to have diabetes. I don't want to have to have three sizes of clothes in my closet anymore. I don't want to feel like I'm constantly thinking about food. I don't want to crave sugar all the time. And if you're constantly giving your brain those instructions, like your brain just doesn't pay attention to the negative language. We have to focus on the positive future pace language. So what do you want? I want a healthy body. I want, I want to be free of medications. I want a healthy weight with healthy blood sugar levels. Okay, why do you want that? Because usually it's not for themselves, it's for someone else. I don't want to be a burden on my children. I want to be the active grandma that's engaged in her grandkids' lives. I want to be able to keep up with my kids on vacation. We have to really narrow down. And then another powerful question to un uncovering your why is, well, how do you want to feel? Because so many people are going through this life just a shell of themselves. You know, so many people are not reaching their physical, their mental, their emotional, or their spiritual potential because they're stuck in a body that is ill and they have the power to change that. But we have to know, well, what do you want? Because if you don't know what you want, you will never get it. So they're always like, oh, I want, I don't want to be tired anymore. I don't want to snap at my husband anymore. Um, yeah, okay. So you want more energy. You want to be more patient. You want to be more in control of your thoughts. So I, I help them create, we call it our personal faith formula. You can call it whatever you want, your health vision statement, literally whatever you want. And you write down, what do you want? Why do you want it? And how do you want to feel? Putting it in present tense language, not I will be, I will be healthy. No, I am healthy. I am working to make healthy choices every day. I prioritize my mental and emotional health every day. I choose to think and do things that make me feel good. I am a present, calm, intentional, and engaged mom and loving and supportive wife. So if we're very intentional about what we want and how we want to feel and we tell ourselves that on a daily basis, that will become your reality. So the first thing that we have to understand is auto-suggestion the power of changing your thoughts because your thoughts create your emotions. Your emotions will drive your actions and your actions will ultimately determine your results. But so many people start at the action phase and they forget to pay attention to their emotions or their thoughts. And so they're constantly starting and stopping, starting something for four weeks and then they stop because they run out of willpower. But when you have mental mastery, Willpower is irrelevant. Your motivation is irrelevant and your self-control is irrelevant because you have total emotional awareness and mastery. So that is ultimately what we want to get to with our clients is that total mental mastery so that whether things go their way or not, they're learning something from it. They don't beat themselves up. Everything is a learning opportunity. So Jesse, we cannot... We can't just jump, jump into the diet and the exercise and the fasting. We have to really take that holistic mindset approach so that people can stop starting and stopping and really make it a lifestyle. Nothing will work if it is not sustained. And we know that over 80% of diets fail. 
So we're really on a mission to facilitate that long-term behavior change. So after that, okay, what do you do? Now you know what you want, why you want it, and how you want to feel. Now what? Now we have to create a system of accountability because a lot of people get off track so easily. They forget their intentions. We have such, humans are very forgetful creatures. So what we really recommend people doing is a daily mindset routine and a weekly accountability meeting with themselves. And during these meetings, these check-in meetings, they can take 15, 20 minutes, not a big deal. What you're doing, I like to use a START framework. So the S is say your personal faith formula. Remind yourself what you're doing and why you're doing it, okay? The T is thankful. What are you thankful for? And the reason that that's very important is because that that forces your mind into the present moment. And the present moment is where you have your personal power. If people are so caught up in thoughts of worry or anxiety, what am I going to eat today? It's because their thoughts are placed on a future event. If their thoughts are all caught up in this guilt, the shame, or the regret, it's because their thoughts are placed on a past event. So focusing on the discipline of gratitude and thankfulness is such a powerful habit. We encourage people to do it every day. Now, the A is the action items, no more than one to three. So if you're really getting serious about behavior change, focusing on too many things at once will lead to overwhelm. Your brain will shut down and it won't continue. So one to three action items, we'll get into kind of the habit hierarchy on what those should be. And then the R is to recognize your wins. So if you're trying to change your habits, we want that positive reinforcement loop continuously. This is not a, oh, I lost five, you know, I lost 0.5 pounds today. Like that's kind of the, that's whatever, you know, like I am so uh, anti-tracking the weight. I know so many people come from a Weight Watchers background, but I'm talking like I didn't have popcorn after dinner last night. I didn't snap at my kids and make the situation worse. I drank my water yesterday. I moved my body for at least 10 minutes, even though I was tired. Um, I spoke kindly to myself. I showed up for my morning mindset routine. I'm here right now doing this. You know, all of those are wins. And so the more we can practice um, positive reinforcement, the more we develop that internal sense of confidence and we stop relying on external things like the scale to say if what we're doing is working or not because we become a better gauge of our own internal emotional state to say, I'm feeling good, therefore this is working. So the last T is the thoughts and the obstacles. So each day when you're thinking through your day, what are some thoughts that have been getting in my way? What are the obstacles that might get in my way today? Oh, we have a work potluck. Hmm. Am I sure to have a healthy option at that work potluck? What are going to be my my personal boundaries around the food at that potluck? Um, So you want to think through that day and think through what obstacles might come up because that proactive reflection, we call it reflection for action, is a skill that must be learned. A really good example of this, we just had office hours and one of my members, she said, I did so well during Thanksgiving and then Friday and oh, by Saturday I was just... I couldn't do any more. She said, um, I lost it. I went overboard. She was at a hockey game. And so she said she overrated the hockey game. And I said, first of all, let's stop catastrophizing that language. All right. You didn't lose it. You didn't go overboard. And this isn't a constant battle, but you, you think it is because that's exactly what you're telling your brain. And so I kind of unwound those things and I said, we have to create more neutral language around food. Stop using things like I completely blew it. I screwed up. I went overboard, yada, yada. I mean, those are so counterproductive. So really getting good at paying attention to that internal dialogue. And I said, hey, did you know that your kids were going to stay with you for you know three days? She's like, yeah. I said, well, why didn't you make all the food ahead of time? I was so focused on Thanksgiving. I said, well, that was an obstacle that we could have planned ahead for. So let's do that next time for Christmas. Viewing everything as a learning opportunity. So those are the first two habits in the Zipley habit hierarchy to reverse insulin resistance. It's all about mindset. Then we get into a few key habits that when you implement these, make everything else easier to implement. The first is just water. So many people are underhydrated, and signs that you're underhydrated would be like headaches, brain fog, you know, uh, if your urine is kind of yellow or more concentrated. 
We cannot overlook these basic health habits. When you are hydrated, you are going to be less likely to crave carbohydrates. And I do want to get into the specifics on nutrition with insulin resistance because there's a lot of misinformation about carbohydrates. Um, so I want to get into that eventually. But then prote- uh, sleep. So sleep is also right at the base of those habits. We want to focus on sleeping seven to nine hours a night. If you're not sleeping and you're trying to intermittently fast, it's not going to be a successful strategy. You're going to feel tired. You're going to feel hungry. You're going to feel cranky. If you're not sleeping and you're trying to exercise and do these intense routines, well, guess what? Like that's going to add cortisol to cortisol and not help the problem. So we need to be implementing things in a thoughtful order. And after we have the mindset, the water, and the sleep, that's when we start getting into the nutritional aspect of things. And we really recommend starting with protein and fiber. And so from a protein standpoint, we really follow Dr. Gabrielle Lyon's advice of about one gram per pound of ideal body weight a day. If you want to be 130 pounds, aim for 130 grams of protein dosed evenly throughout the day, at least 30 grams at a time to really support that healthy muscle mass. And then for fiber, I recommend women about 25 grams a day, men about 35 grams, ideally from the non-starchy vegetables, low glycemic fruits. After that, we can kind of move our way up, but can't you just see the, 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 the simplicity of that and the common sense approach to like, Hey, Let's build the foundation of our house before we get fancy and talk about shingles and our fasting strategies and stuff like that. All right. Well, a lot we can get into within that. And I want to take it back to a couple of the different foundations, the sleep and the hydration. These are areas, of course, are very foundational. And it wasn't areas I anticipated we get into at this point. And I'm happy we are just because, you know, you're the lady that's big on insulin resistance and diet. And of course, a lot more than that, but I didn't picture us going here first, but this is good. We'll set the foundation. So when it comes to hydration, you mentioned water hydration. How do people know if, you know, they're just at this point drinking whatever when they're thirsty, how often are they drinking? How much, what kind of water Let's really get granular and and sift this out so people understand. Okay. So the the basic recommendations to start with are at least half your body weight in ounces of water a day. If you weigh 200 pounds, you should aim for at least 100 ounces of water a day. Now there's differing opinions on, well, when should we drink this? What I recommend is drinking it during the daytime hours and reducing intake in the evenings because that will help you sleep better because you'll get up less to urinate during the middle of the night. Some people will say don't drink a lot of water when you're eating because it messes up your digestive enzymes. I don't personally have an issue with that. If you have digestive problems, that's something that you can consider. Pure filtered water is going to be best. You don't want to be having water that's contaminated with heavy metals or anything like that because that's going to create a a uh, stressful environment for yourselves. I don't have any preference on like water filters or anything like that, but just water. I think up to about 400 milligrams of caffeine a day is from what the research says won't contribute to dehydration. But let's be honest. If you're not sleeping well and you're still drinking caffeinated beverages and alcohol, those probably need to be drastically cut down or removed from your diet. I know it's painful to hear. I was a four cup of coffee drinker a day. Um, When I started this journey, I also added a bunch of added sugar to that from my peppermint mocha coffee creamer. Um, But we got it. We have to be honest with ourselves. If you're having four cups of coffee in, in the day and then you're having to take a sleep aid at night, let's maybe cut the coffee and cut the sleep aid, you know? So let's, let's be honest, even though it's hard. And that's the thing that a lot of people just aren't willing to do. But if you want to, if you want good sleep, you're going to have to reduce your caffeine and your alcohol. Um, my husband had a beer the other night and we have an eight sleep, which is kind of a, a mattress cover and it tells you how you slept. And he had the beer right before bed and his sleep was all over the place. One of my members had a glass of wine before bed and her sleep was all over the place. We're not recognizing how alcohol is impacting our sleep. So I really encourage people to reduce or eliminate their caffeine if possible, if they need to. Uh, 
in all honesty, it took me months to get there. So I was at four cups a day. Then I did two cups a day. Then I did one cup of day, one cup a day. And then I went to decaf. And it, when I went to decaf, it took me six weeks to feel like my energy was back to normal. And I have really good baseline health. So I was very dependent upon that caffeine. Um, from an alcohol standpoint, it's not empty calories. It's absolutely not. It's a toxic substance to your body. And it impairs your ability to think clearly. It impairs your sleep. And so I think when we're talking about sleep and hydration, we can't exclude alcohol. We can't exclude caffeine. We have to have that honest conversation that if you're continuing to make choices that are harmful for your health, you will pay for it down the road. So balance it out. I'm not, I'm not a purist by any means, but like, let's make some conscious choices about what we're drinking. Um, if you're fasting, I say longer than about 14 to 16 hours a day. I think electrolytes are wonderful to include. I like the LMNT brand, just the unflavored ones, but you can make your own electrolytes. Um, you know, from a beverage standpoint, I think a big mistake I see people make is the sugar-free stuff. Diet Coke. People are, that's, it's the caffeine, Jesse. Like they're just addicted to the caffeine. So if you're going to choose something that's not water, I really recommend like a, a naturally essen essenced drink that doesn't have artificial sweeteners. Even though those artificial sweeteners won't necessarily spike your blood sugar, not all of them anyways, they are altering your gut microbiome and you will have a long-term consequence of um, poor blood glucose management long-term. So I really encourage people to reduce those artificially sweetened beverages too. Yeah, I agree with that. And as we pivot from hydration to sleep, a few things that you've touched on we want to be aware of is one, making sure we're not having too much before bed, having to get up and go to the washroom. You mentioned the fact with caffeine disrupting our sleep and alcohol Let's move into sleep beyond hydration now and talk about some of the things we can do. For a lot of people, sleep is just sleep. It's like, okay, am I getting that quote unquote eight hours of sleep that you hear cited time and time again? What can we do if we feel like our sleep isn't good right now to assess and some of the changes as you've learned and been on your journey that you've made to sleep better? I've made so many changes and a lot of them are so simple. Right now I have a blue light. My, my night shade is on my computer. So I look a little bit yellow. You look a little bit yellow because I'm blocking all the blue light. And the very, very first thing I recommend people do because it's the simplest thing to do is to purchase a pair of amber colored blue light blocking glasses. You can get them on. I like the Spectra brand. They're about $30 on Amazon and they have fit over kind. So if you wear readers at night, you can get this, you know, <laughs> The big, they are not sexy. They are not sexy by any stretch of the imagination. But what is sexy is good sleep. And so wearing those, I usually do it about an hour to two hours before I want to be asleep. Now, what that does, people don't recognize this because we're so used to this lit environment all of the time. But your body is very sensitive to light with your circadian rhythm. So our sleep wake cycle that runs on light. And we're exposed to a lot more blue light from all of our devices than what our physiology is used to. So I was interviewing a light expert for my podcast, and they said that the blue light that's emitted from your computer screen or your phone or your iPad or your TV has about as much blue light as the sunlight does at noon. So when you're staring at a computer screen, you're absorbing the same amount of blue light that you would at noon. And what that does is it raises your cortisol levels to keep you alert. So cortisol not only is like your stress hormone, it's just kind of like your alertness hormone. And what most people don't realize is that cortisol and melatonin, which is your sleepy hormone, are opposing hormones, like on a teeter-totter. So if your cortisol is high, your melatonin cannot come up. And so people are sitting there in front of their blue light devices, scrolling their phone, on their iPad, checking email, um, watching TV, and then they're popping a melatonin gummy. It's like, just block the blue light, lower the cortisol, and then your melatonin can come up naturally. So really focusing on your light environment. Don't turn lights on in your house after dark. 
keep it dark, wear your blue light blockers one to two hours before you want to be in bed. It has to be the orange kind. You can't be wearing like those clear kind or the yellow kind. You can do that during the day if you want, but at night it needs to be the amber colored ones. So that's the very first thing. The second thing that I really recommend is what is your nighttime routine and does it include anything stressful? So scrolling through Facebook, looking at controversial posts about politics, that is not something that we want to be doing before bed. Um, having stressful conversations with your partner, like this is not the time to pick a fight before bed. You can know, like if you're ever stressed, you know how hard it is to sleep when you're stressed out. So reducing scrolling on social media, comparing yourself to others, creating all of these thoughts, totally, totally unhelpful for your sleep. We want to do calming activities. It's so I, I personally watch TV before bed with my blue light blockers. I'm not like a no screens before bed for an hour kind of person. That's just not, not my lifestyle. But if you want to read, if you want to journal, it's fine. So creating some sort of nighttime routine to reduce the stressful activities. I don't recommend working out right before bed because that, that, that will increase your cortisol as well, unless it's like gentle stretching, gentle walking, but nothing intense before bed. So those would be the two biggest things, Jesse, is blue light blocking, creating nighttime routine, just like you would a baby. It's not like <laughs> when we have a baby at, do you have any, I, I don't know, our kids just slept terrible and we tried so hard to create a nighttime routine, but treat yourself like you would a child, create a lovely nighttime routine for yourself. I think next would be the alcohol. So if you're having a glass of alcohol at night, that probably, that needs to go have, if you're going to choose to drink, do it earlier in the day so that your body has time to metabolize it. Otherwise, you're going to be interrupted um, middle of the night with sleep, right? So for women, especially in peri per perimenopause, maybe they're having hot flashes, you got to control the temperature of the room. Keeping it cool, the eight sleep, it's, it's, an, it's an investment. Let me tell you what, like that's not a cheap mattress cover by any stretch of the imagination. But my husband and I justified it because we spend a third of our lives sleeping. And then the other two thirds of our life is directly impacted by the quality of that sleep. So we're going to be sleeping well. We, we live in an old farmhouse. And so there was very little insulation, very hot in the summer, cold in the winter. So we wanted some better temperature control for our bed. Keeping it dark is so important, again, for that um, the circadian rhythm. So getting blackout curtains, wearing an eye mask, all of those little things will help. Keeping it quiet so whether that's a white noise machine, you want, you want to keep it quiet. So earplugs can sometimes be helpful. Um, and then backtracking earlier in the day. So those are kind of all things we do immediately around bedtime. But if we backtrack, added sugar is terrible for your sleep. These blood sugar swings, like, oh man. So eating a high carb meal, a super high carb meal, that's probably not going to be great for your sleep. Eating added sugar, not good for your sleep. So really getting specific, looking at the nutrition panel, reducing your sugar intake is one of the best things that you can do for your health. Backtracking even more in the day, reducing the coffee, switching to decaf coffee, and then even earlier, morning sunshine. So right when you wake up within about 30 to 90 minutes, if you can expose yourself to some sunlight, outside is best because it's filtered through the windows, but getting some sunlight in your eyes helps kind of reset that circadian rhythm first thing in the morning. So all of those things, all of those tips are kind of the main ones. And those would be examples of action items. So going back to like that start daily meeting agenda, someone's action item might be buy blue light blockers and put them on one hour before bed or buy um, an eye mask or get blackout curtains. So those are how we would incorporate those strategic pieces into that daily meeting agenda so that you're continually optimizing the right things at the right time so that the subsequent habits lined up like dominoes just fall a lot easier. Everything is easier after a good night of sleep. So that did that answer your question? No, oh, that was great. Really in depth. Couple of questions I had that came up as you're explaining. You mentioned the fact that right now I look a little bit yellow because of something physical in front of your computer or some software on your computer. Yeah. W what is that specifically? Mine. I just use the um, night shift. So on okay. my on my Mac, if you go to like system settings and then you go to display and then it's night shift and I just turn it on till tomorrow and it's always on. Got it. 
Yeah. And then the sleep mat you've talked about, it sounds yeah. like it does a couple different things. It regulates temperature and also tells you the next day how good your sleep was. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So it's called Eight Sleep is what it's called. There's other options on the market. We just chose this one. And there's an app on your phone. And so it syncs to your phone. And the goal, obviously, is to get eight hours of sleep a night. And there's little channels that go through the mattress pad. It's just a mattress pad that goes on top of the bed. You can buy a mattress with it. We didn't do that. And then there's like this unit on the side where distilled water goes into. And the water is pumped into this really thin mattress cover. You can't really feel it. And then it's dual controlled. So my husband has a side because he's a little hot box. And I have my own side because I'm always cold. And so we can adjust our temperature independently of each other and sleep better. And then the other thing, when you look at the app in the morning, it gives you pretty good data about what was, you know, your deep sleep, your REM or rapid eye movement sleep. When did you fall asleep? When did you wake up? What was your sleep quality score? And I w I've been sick over the last week with like a, a head cold. And I can tell you it's pretty accurate because on the nights I didn't sleep well, it showed me I didn't sleep well. And on the nights I did, it shows me that I did. So for me, that's pretty motivating to learn more about what did, what did I do before I fell asleep? Um, what did I do during the day that facilitated good sleep? What did I not do during the day that made me that that uh, facilitated poor sleep? So that's the eight sleep. It's it's a simple system once you get it set up, and you can adjust the temperature up and down manually. Um, I think it's supposed to automatically sense what is best for you and adjust it like that. But I haven't gotten. I, I just usually do it manually. So. All right. So so far we've gone over mindset, then we've gone down to hydration sleep. Let's continue the story here. What are other areas people want to consider when it comes to health optimization? Yeah. So I think before we get into nutrition, because that'll probably take up the meat of the conversation, no pun intended. Um, we, I think we should talk a little bit more about stress management. Um, one time I was talking to a client and she was like, oh, I'm keeping my carbs really low. And I think I need to cut the potato. And I was like, what is your stress like? And she said, oh, my boss is just so demanding and I'm having to work in the evenings and I'm having to work on the weekends. And I said, isn't it a lot harder to have that honest conversation with your boss about your work boundaries than to cut the carbs? So, so many people are not having honest conversations with people in their life who are stressing them out and they're not having healthy emotional boundaries. And from a stress management standpoint, I really think that some sort of spiritual practice can be very helpful. I don't care what religion you are. I don't care if you ascribe to any religion or faith, but having some sort of spiritual practice to connect with God or source or hi the higher power, or however you want to say it, that can be really grounding for people. And so I think connecting to your spirituality in some way, shape, or form can be really beneficial for stress management. I think having, um, having an honest conversation with yourself about your level of happiness and choosing to do things that light you up and give you joy and choosing to do less of what doesn't is important. And people are, you're in, you are in control of your life. You're like, well, I can't do that because I'm not in control of my schedule. It's like, yes, you are. Yes, you are. You are in full control of your own choices, full control of your own life. And if you don't think that you are, it's because you're not taking responsibility for it. So from a stress management standpoint, I think that learning to control your thoughts, learning the power of thoughts, connecting with spirituality is helpful, but recognizing that sometimes professional help is needed. If you need counseling, get some counseling. If you need an antidepressant for a certain amount of time, that's okay. But we have to stop this chronic cycle of busyness and stress and some practical things here is I believe every person's automatic response to any request should be no. And I think as women, we are trained to be helpful. We are trained to be kind and we are trained to fear other people's opinions of us. And so um, we say yes. We say yes to the extra project at work that we're not getting paid for. We say yes to the extra activity that our kid wants to do, even though we're going to be the ones that have to manage the schedule and drive them to that. We say yes when someone offers us an extra piece of dessert that we don't actually want. And so we have to really get good at saying no. 
and creating intentional margin in our schedule to do things that bring us joy and light us up. So if you're not addressing the mindset side, the sleep, the stress, all the diet and exercise stuff is just not going to be as effective. So I think I really wanted to lay the foundation and encourage people to step into their personal power, take control of their thoughts, take control of their emotions, sleep better and de-stress so that the nutrition and exercise habits that they want to adopt can be adopted easier. And I'm assuming at least a part of this stress story, when you take it down to the physiology, is the spike in cortisol. And if you're somebody who's under chronic stress and that's happening throughout the day every day, an analogy when we get to diet, it'll make more sense, would be like having a carb snack every couple of hours or every hour and spiking blood glucose that way. This is just a different way of approaching the physiology and having a similar effect. Mm -hmm. So is that when it comes down to the root of stress, when it ties into insulin resistance, is this, is this how it all ties together? That's part of it. So kind of like having a high carb snack throughout the day, you're just snacking on your stress. Um, but I think also just from a, from a psychological standpoint, how does stress affect our subsequent behaviors, right? So there's that immediate hormonal reaction of the increased cortisol and the increased glucose and the increased insulin. But then there's also, like my client was saying, like, you know, I was, what'd she say? My, my resolve weakened is what she said. So if you're not managing your stress, your resolve is going to weaken and that's going to affect subsequent behaviors a day from now, a week from now. So I think that's the other side of the stress coin, not the immediate, but also the delayed effects of stress. Got it. Yep. Yeah. It's not so simple. Yeah. No. Well, let's move on from there. So we've come touched on the stress piece here and the cortisol. What do we want to make sure we're addressing next? So after that comes diet. And I think that in order to understand nutrition, you have to understand macronutrients because a lot of women are going to their doctor and saying, I need to lose weight. And their doctor is completely dismissive, especially if they're postmenopausal women. Their doctor might even say things like, well, I like my women a little bit bigger, or I like you to have a little bit of reserve in case you get sick. Um, a common response is we'll just eat less and exercise more. It's just all about calories in calories out. Those are not true. Weight gain is not an inevitable part of aging. And it's important to emphasize that insulin resistance increases after menopause. Okay. So for women in this phase of life, it's super frustrating because they're like, I'm not eating or exercising any differently than I was 10 years ago, but now I'm putting on weight. Why? And so we have to address the fact that, well, how you're eating, how you were eating and exercising was working maybe when you had more estrogen in your system. But when your estrogen plummets after menopause, your insulin resistance goes up. And that's why similar you've had on the podcast before from Dr. Fung, he said a woman's risk of heart disease is lower than a man's until she goes through menopause. And that's because when that estrogen goes down, the insulin goes up and that increases a woman's risk for heart disease. So if you have been just diluted by this eat less, exercise more notion, and you've lost the same 20 pounds five times in your life on various diets, just know that there's hope. And when you understand how to eat to keep insulin low instead of how to eat to keep calories low, the door is open. And as we've alluded, the beautiful thing about the insulin story is there's more than just one lever to lower insulin. Because in the calories out in calories out model, you have diet and you have exercise. But when we're talking about the insulin model, you have sleep, you have stress, you have diet, you have exercise, you have environmental toxins, you have medications. All these things can contribute to elevated levels of insulin and inflammation. So I wanted to lay that groundwork because I think a lot of people, when we come to diet and exercise, have a lot of skepticism that nothing's going to work for them. And that couldn't be further from the truth. So I wanted to talk with a dis- start with a discussion of macronutrients, okay? Because I think your podcast is so good and you have the best people on here. But I think sometimes when people are so good at what they do, they forget to break it down into layman's terms and meet people where they're at. So with macronutrients, macro means big, right? Large, large amounts of nutrients. There's three primary macronutrients, four if you include alcohol, which I'm leaving out of the discussion. So carbohydrates, proteins, 
dietary fats. Those are the three macronutrients. Under the carbohydrates umbrella, there are three main types of carbohydrates, okay? Fiber, there's soluble and insoluble. I'm going to leave it at fiber for now. There's starches and there's sugars. Now, let's start with the starch, and Dr. Lustig on your podcast alluded to this, but in case people haven't listened to that interview, there's, you know, a starch is not a starch. So there's amylose and there's amylopectin. Amylopectin. I remember that because it's a longer word, right? So there's there's more branches. Amylopectin starch is like a tree with many branches. And so it's it, the the di- the enzymes that digest the multiple molecules of glucose can do that quickly. So think white bread, white rice, white pasta. Amylopectin starches break down fast. And then the amylose starches, if you think of like a branch with one end, like two ends. So there's only two ends where those enzymes can break up that glucose. It's going to be digested slower. So I'm not going to get into a lot of examples yet. We can talk about some more nuances, but think like beans, lentils, oats, those kinds of starches are going to be more like they're going to be digested slower. Okay. So the sugars, breaking down the sugars, the the three main ones I talk about are glucose, which Dr. Fun spoke extensively about on the podcast, fructose, which Dr. Lustig talked on the podcast, and galactose. So galactose is like the simple sugar. All of those are simple sugars. One sugar molecule is a simple sugar, okay? Simple carbohydrate. So the glucose molecule is what is found circulating in your bloodstream. That's why it's called blood glucose, okay? So the glucose molecule is what combines to form those different types of starches, either the amylose, which is the one with two ends, or the amylopectin. So that's why they say starch is just sugar because it is, it's a, it's glucose, which is a simple sugar. Now, fructose is the type of sugar that's found naturally in fruit or a type of sugar. It's the sweet stuff. Okay. Um, the problem with the glycemic index, you know, when we're talking about diabetes, insulin resistance, eat a low glycemic index food. Well, fructose doesn't raise blood glucose, but it is still very harmful in excess for your liver. And so things like apple juice, for example, won't have as high as a gly- of a glycemic index, but it has a ton of fructose in it. Or things like honey and agave, these natural sweeteners that people are eating have a ton of fructose in them compared to table sugar. So they're not benign by any stretch of the imagination just because they're natural. So fructose, glucose, galactose, galactose acts a lot like glucose. We eat it in much smaller quantities. So I think breaking down the macronutrients and then bringing it back together, right? So, okay, well, what is table sugar? Table sugar is one molecule of glucose plus one molecule of fructose bonded bonded together. Well, what is high fructose corn syrup? High fructose corn syrup is a percentage of glucose and a percentage of fructose, but they're unbonded. So high fructose corn syrup will digest even faster than table sugar, which is why um, the pops and stuff like that with the high fructose corn syrup are terrible for our health. They spike your blood sugar so fast and that shunts it to the liver. It's like a missile to the liver. Um, And so high fructose corn syrup, sugar, If there's a really great chart online, if you look up like glucose and fructose concentrations of different sweeteners, and it has like a bar graph to show you, okay, table sugar is 50, 50, depending on the fruit, the high fructose corn syrup, you know, 45, 55, um, agave, you know, 80, 20, I don't know the exact, but you can see exactly how it's broken down. So I think when we're talking about a low carb diet, a low sugar diet, it's important to understand that a carb is not a carb, a sugar is not a sugar, a starch is not a starch. Some are going to be more benign, like less harmful than others. So the ones that we really want to be controlling from a starch and a sugar standpoint are high amylopectin starches, like the white breads, the white rice, the white pasta, because those are going to spike your blood sugar, causing a high insulin response. And high insulin responses will shunt that food towards fat storage. 
right? So the amylopectin starches, that's why there's a lot of evidence on plant-based diets because most of those diets contain a lot of um, amylo starches, the beans, the lentils, um, legumes, those kinds of things. And then when we're talking about the fruit, if we can bias our fruit intake towards fruits that have more fiber and less sugar, you're going to be better off from a blood sugar standpoint. So when we're, those are like the big macronutrients, right? But what's more important to understand is there's a calorie and there's an, an insulin response to those macronutrients. And a lot of people are familiar with the calorie model. A gram of fat has nine calories. A gram of starch has four calories. Uh, a gram of fiber, more like two calories. A gram of protein. I think, did I say protein already at four calories? Not yet. Protein is four, right? So a lot of people are used to the calories, but what about the insulin response? And that's what I want people to understand is a calorie is not a calorie once it's down the hatch because every single calorie will impact your insulin and your hormones differently. So when we're talking about carbohydrates, because we dug into those first, let's talk about those first. The fiber will actually slow the blood glucose and the blood sugar response of anything else that's in that meal. So having fiber with your meal will help you remain stable with your blood sugars. If you're looking at like a little, um, an arch, you know, the refined starches and sugars that will spike your blood sugar, spike your blood insulin. When we're looking at protein, protein has a moderate insulin response, but much lower than the carbohydrates. And people might be, might be thinking, well, how does protein cause an insulin response if it doesn't raise blood sugar? Well, there's something called your incretin hormones, which are in your gut. And so that is how protein can raise your insulin levels. But the trade-off is worth it. Because remember, long-term, we want to maintain our muscle mass because that's good for insulin sensitivity and it's good for function. You cannot maintain your muscle mass without adequate protein and adequate muscle stimulus. So protein has a moderate response, but fat, even though it's highest in calories, has the lowest insulin response. And that's why when people go on these keto diets, they lose a ton of weight because they drop their insulin levels very quickly. They also get into ketosis which helps them feel fuller because we know that ketones, which are a byproduct of fat metabolism, help you feel fuller. So the problem, in my opinion, with a keto diet is a lot of people have a hard time sustaining it long, long term. And so I like to say, well, you can get into ketosis without following a strict keto diet. Um, but when it comes to dietary fats, let's break those down a little bit more before we get into some specific recommendations. So dietary fats, similar to like the umbrella approach with the carbohydrates, the starch, the simple sugars, the fiber, right? I like to say the dietary fats, a fat is not a fat. We start with the trans fats, of course, which were banned, I think in 2018 by the FDA in the United States. Um, industrial trans fats were banned because they were linked to heart disease. Um, those would be like the partially, partially hydrogenated oils, they took a vegetable oil that was liquid. They made it solid to improve the shelf life, the texture, the taste of foods. Can't do that anymore. Um, but there are natural trans fats found in ruminant animals um, in small amounts, and those are okay. So moving our way up are the saturated fats. <sighs> I won't get too far into the details, but there are short, medium, and long-chain triglycerides or saturated fats. So the MCT oils that everyone's crazy about, those are a type of saturated fat. Um, good for your brain health. Good for, you know, it's, there are benefits to certain types of saturated fat, especially the MCTs. So the long chain triglycerides um, or the saturated fats, that's most of the saturated fat that people eat. That's the stuff in the full fat dairy um, and animal products. Um, saturated fat has long been demonized because it raises cholesterol. This could be, I'm, you've probably had a podcast on this, um, about saturated fat raising cholesterol and is that a concern? Saturated fat will raise your HDL cholesterol. There is not a drug that will raise your HDL cholesterol. HDL cholesterol has been shown to be protective against cardiovascular disease. Saturated fat will also raise the large, buoyant LDL particles that are not as atherogenic as the small, dense LDL particles. 
So I think that that's a conversation. It's like, okay, well, it raises cholesterol, but is that actually a problem? No. And if people are concerned about their cholesterol, I have a really good video breaking down on YouTube, um, LDL cholesterol versus LDL particle number. Because what really matters when it comes to cardiovascular disease is the particle number. People can test that with an ApoB test. So they can order it. It's 30 bucks online, ApoB. That'll tell you your LDL particle number. The other thing I recommend people get is an LP little a test. Um, and that's something that they can order online as well. That is more of a genetic risk factor for cardiovascular disease and how, how things might clot and form together. So if people have a high genetic predisposition to cardiovascular disease, I generally do recommend a lower saturated fat intake, not zero, like just lower, bias your fats towards the other types that we're going to talk about. But some people can eat saturated fats liberally and not have it affect their ApoB levels. Um, the LP little a, by the way, is not something you need to t check often. It's more of a genetic marker. So you just need to get it once. So check your ApoB, eat some, eat a bunch of saturated fat, see what happens. Uh, if ApoB goes up, then that's probably not a good sign for you. You should lower your saturated fat intake, but if yours stays the same, then you, you're going to be okay. But regardless, I do believe that people, people should still bias their fat intake towards some other types of fats that we're going to talk about. So even if you're one of those people that can get away with eating a lot of saturated fat, there's there's more benefits in other types of foods that have the other types of fats. So there's monounsaturated and polyunsaturated, okay? Monounsaturated are also known as omega-9 fatty acids. So these are the things found in olives and avocados primarily. That's going to be, those foods are a lot higher in antioxidants, flavonoids, other beneficial compounds than like the butter. You know, I'm not anti-butter. I'm just like, well, olives and avocados have more health benefits than butter has. Um, so I think that is, uh, that's a healthy fat for sure. Um, omega nines. So the other types would be the polyunsaturated and this is more nuanced. So we have omega three and we have omega six polyunsaturated. The problem is that these dietary guidelines are, are recommending people eat processed omega six oils from things like corn, cottonseed, soy, over the saturated fats. And you've had a great podcast episode, episode on linoleic acid, which is one of these omega-6 fatty acids, highly inflammatory. And insulin and inflammation are hand in hand. So we cannot, we can't lower insulin resistance if we're not also lowering inflammation. So if you're eating a bag of Lay's potato chips and it says canola oil or some Pringles chips or whatever, canola oil, soy, soybean oil, all of those oils are going to be highly, anti, uh, highly inflammatory. And I recommend choosing a different option, choosing a chip with avocado oil instead. So from an omega-6 standpoint, those are the things found in the nuts and the seeds. If it's unprocessed, fine, go for it. If you don't have a oxalate, or, that's a whole nother conversation, oxalates and lectins and all that stuff. Um, but if you don't have sensitivities to those, go for it. Omega-3s are going to be probably even better than the omega-6, but not all omega-3s are created equally. So there is ALA, uh, EPA, and DHA. So these all the plant-based folks, if you're eating the hemp hearts, the flaxseed oil, these plant sources of omega-3s, well, there's a really low conversion rate to EPA and DHA, which, is, which are the types that are actually anti-inflammatory. So I recommend the, the wild-caught fatty fish, um, the blue-green algae supplements. Those are going to be more bioavailable forms of the anti-inflammatory type of omega-3. So I think from a macronutrient conversation, we can't just leave it at a low-carb diet. Eat a low, like There's so much more nuance here on, okay, you can eat low-carb, but if you're still eating high uh, inflammatory seed oils, if your fats are junk, you're not optimizing your health. If you're underdosing your protein, you're not optimizing your long-term health. So when we're talking about, okay, someone has insulin resistance, which we should probably talk about, well, how do you know? And you covered that a little bit with Dr. Fung, but maybe we can get to that in a bit. But if you know you have insulin resistance, if you have a high fasting insulin, 
If you have excess abdominal fat, if you have high blood pressure, high triglycerides, low HDL, low energy, frequent carb cravings, those are all signs of insulin resistance. What I recommend is to take a step back and not do anything drastic and recommend, like realize that you do not want to lose weight if you cannot maintain that because the weight will come back on. So don't lose weight in a way that you can't live the rest of your life. That's a huge recommendation that I have. So with that in mind, I say, start with the lowest hanging fruit for you. And what I recommend is adding the protein and adding the fiber before you start to reduce the sugar. So on our Zivli habit hierarchy, instead of just saying, well, just intermittently fast for 24 hours or just eat for eight hours a day or just cut all the added sugar. Well, it's a lot easier to fast and it's a lot easier to reduce added sugar if you're properly fueling your body in the first place when you are eating. So that's why I really, really recommend optimal optimizing your protein intake first. And we have an ultimate food guide that goes over all of these guidelines. People can download it for free. They can calculate how much protein they need. We have charts with like animal-based protein and, and plant-based protein and all the fiber charts that they could need. So if people want some more specifics outside of the podcast, I highly recommend they get that download. So when we're planning out someone's nutrition plan, we have to figure out what's your goal. Is your goal to lose weight? Is your goal to gain muscle? Most people want to lose weight. So I say, great. From a calorie standpoint, go for 12 to 13 calories per pound of ideal body weight. So if you want to weigh 130 pounds, take 130 times 12.5. That's going to be your calorie goal. Then from there, we're going to figure out your protein goal. 130 grams of protein split evenly across three meals to start. If you need a snack, if you're like, ah, I have a really bad snacking habit, fine. Like, split it up and add a snack. From there, you can you can really interchange the fats and the carbohydrates based on your exercise level. The more you exercise, especially intense exercise, the more carbohydrates you can tolerate from a, an insulin resistance standpoint. Most people I work with aren't exercising that much. And so we recommend a higher fat proportion to carbohydrate Usually starting around 80 grams of net carbohydrates a day is a pretty realistic amount, 80 to 90. Getting, um, you know, 30 grams, no more than 30 grams of net carbs per meal, that's a really doable goal for most people. Starting there, seeing how you're feeling, seeing how you're progressing. If someone's very insulin resistant, that's that's probably going to be too many carbohydrates for them. But that's what I recommend is figure out how to fuel your body before you fast. Because the fasting, if you don't know how to fuel your body, it's just a quick fix tool again. And when you stop fasting, the weight is going to come back on. So we have to figure out how do you eat for the rest of your life and then use fasting as an adjunct tool to augment your progress. From a fasting standpoint, I really recommend people start at 12 hours a day because a lot of people aren't doing that, Jesse. A lot of people are having dinner, maybe six or seven, And then they're sitting down on the couch eight to nine and they're having some popcorn or they're having some chips or some cheese or some wine. And then they're getting up right first thing in the morning at six o'clock and they're putting their sugar creamer in their coffees. Like they're not fasting for 12 hours a day. So create that baseline of 12 hours a day, three solid meals, split the protein throughout the day and you will feel so much better. And then if needed, if you're plateaued, you know, then we can look at the portions. Then we can look at how much fat are you eating. Then we can look at modifying your fasting schedule. But does that make sense, Jesse, from a nutrition standpoint to say, let's not just put a blanket low carb statement on this and call it a day? Yeah, no, there's a lot of nuance there. That was great. And for people who are tuned into this point and they've heard us talk about insulin resistance, you talked about a number of the different signs and symptoms somebody might have if they're experiencing that, let's talk about what causes it and then the continuum of what's happening underneath with the physiology as somebody continues to become more insulin resistant. So I like to call it the yellow brick road of insulin resistance. We have a graphic somewhere on our Instagram account about that. And in your 20s and 30s, you can get away with a lot. Uh, you can drink, you can stay up late, you can party, you can eat a bunch, and you're probably not going to gain that much weight. Um, But what's happening is your insulin levels are still rising. 
So the research has shown that fasting insulin can predict type 2 diabetes up to two decades before fasting glucose. Most physicians are not checking fasting insulin. They're just checking glucose. So people are kind of surprised when, oh, I have diabetes now. Well, if you had been checking your insulin, you would have had a 20-year heads up on that and 20 years to change your lifestyle. So in their 20s, they probably don't really experience much besides maybe some low energy. Maybe they're slowly starting to gain weight. Maybe they're having like brain fog, like, oh, I feel like I should be sharper than I am. Um, But then when you get to your 30s and your 40s, if you haven't dialed in your stress, your sleep, your nutrition, and your physical activity, you will start to gain weight you will start to have symptoms of insulin resistance, maybe not the diagnostic criteria yet. So we're going to continue to see that weight gain as the primary symptom. Sometimes swelling easily can be a sign of insulin resistance as well, especially after a high-carb meal. Um, But then 40s to 50s, that's really where those preclinical signs are going to turn into clinical signs. You're going to get diagnosed with high blood sugars, prediabetes, and you have to look at your own labs. I have a client once and she said she was pre-diabetic for years and her doctor only wrote excellent on her blood work, did not address the pre-diabetic blood glucose level at all. And so once she started looking at her own lab, she realized, oh my gosh, I've been pre-diabetic for years and my doctor didn't say anything to me. Your doctor's looking for red flags not optimal health parameters, unless they're a functional medicine doctor, likely. Not not all of them, but that's kind of the standard of practice these days. So high blood sugar, right? Anything really over 90 fasting, that's a little bit concerning to me because there's normal and there's optimal. And I think Levels Health is doing such a good job of bringing to light the difference between normal and optimal blood glucose levels. So it's a little bit hard because if you're checking it first thing in the morning, Jesse, there's that cortisol response. Um, and so your blood sugar will be a little bit higher within the first 90 minutes to two hours of awakening. So if you can check it at like 10 or 11 a.m. fasting, that's going to be a better true marker of your fasting glucose level. But 100 to 125 is technically pre-diabetic. And then 126 or higher is diabetic. And then there's A1C levels associated with that as well. Um, but when you're in your forties and fifties, you're going to see the blood sugar starting to rise. You're going to see your blood pressure starting to rise. Your doctor might suggest that you go on a blood pressure medication, or you're going to see your cholesterol start to rise, which is ridiculous. Do not accept a statin based on total cholesterol or LDL cholesterol. Read Dr. Lustig's book, the metabolical that really explains it well. Um, those would be some of the main symptoms, abdominal obesity. Um, we can't just look at, we cannot rely on BMI. So many children are metabolically unhealthy and the doctor is not doing anything about it because their BMI is okay. Well, if you look at a kid, you can tell if that's, that kid is skinny fat. Okay. Thin it's called tofi. So thin on the inside. What is it? Tofu, tofi, thin inside, fat tofi. outside. To. Thin on the outside, fat on the inside. Yeah, thin out. I had it backwards. Thin outside, fat inside, tofi. That's a real thing. Super obvious with kids and adolescents. If if you're looking at their stomach and they have a deep belly button, that means that they have a lot of that fat going on. So I have two young kids and I see it all the time. Kids are eating way too much sugar. So thin on the ends, thin thin outside, fat inside. Yep. Exactly. Yes. But the other side of that coin is metabolic healthy obesity, so MHO. Because a lot of people are walking around and we have a I'm not I am trying really hard to say this sensitively, but we have a body positive culture going on right now that is not um setting setting our society up for optimal metabolic health. And when we're talking about metabolic healthy obesity, what that essentially is is like one step away from metabolic syndrome, right? And that includes um, excess weight plus one other thing. So when people are metabolically healthy, obese, they can have like an excess waist circumference plus like high blood sugar, high blood pressure, high triglycerides, low HDL. But if they don't have two, okay. Right. But if we're checking fasting insulin, 
only 7% of people with obesity are considered metabolically healthy. So if we check fasting insulin, just to to let you know, 43% of people who would otherwise be considered a metabolically healthy obese person are now not. And so that is really important that we're not giving a false sense of security to people with obesity that they're metabolically healthy. Because what does that do to them? That sets them up for hardship down the road. And I've seen it as a geriatric physical therapist. We're we're doing our patients a disservice if we're not being honest with them about their health and not empowering them to be honest with themselves. It's not about the size or shape of your body. It's about how you feel and about your health. So I want to emphasize that because I don't want to come across as unsensitive. So we have to stop relying on the BMI scale and we have to start checking fasting insulin levels. That's going to start happening 40s to 50s. You're going to start to see those symptoms. And then if you really haven't been paying attention in your your 50s and 60s, that's what I call your pivotal decade. That's the time to make the changes. And if you don't, when after you're 60, you will feel the effects. So 50s to 60s, that's when you're going to get diagnosed with high blood pressure with type 2 diabetes. That's when you're really going to start to notice signs of brain fog or memory issues. And then if you don't do anything about it, Jesse, the risk that you're not going to get off of medications increases. So by the time you're 60, if you haven't been taking care of yourself, you will have mobility problems. You're going to have arthritis. You're going to be getting your joints replaced. Oh, it's sad. It's And you can tell I'm really passionate about this because so much can be prevented. Um, that's why I started this business in the first place was I said, oh my gosh, I'm working with these 80 and 90 year olds. And if I had worked with them 20 or 30 years earlier, they wouldn't need a geriatric physical therapist. They just needed some health coaching (laughs) earlier in life. They needed to be empowered with the right decisions, the right information, and they needed to follow through. So other things, other ways that this can manifest along this journey Um, infertility, big deal. I don't know about you, but I have in my, maybe it's just because of my season in life. I know so many couples who are struggling with infertility right now. Um, so PCOS is highly, highly associated with insulin resistance. Um, it's polycystic ovarian syndrome. It can definitely affect fertility. Erectile dysfunction in men is associated with insulin resistance. So I think just think about the quality of life, Jesse. Like it's it's devastating. Insulin resistance is a devastating disease that can be prevented and it can be reversed. But you have to have the right information and the right support to do so. Otherwise, you're just going to be doing one thing for four weeks and then stopping and then doing another thing for four weeks and stopping. Um, so I think that's kind of how it manifests. And then you know, I like to like type two diabetes is just like a stop on the train on the insulin resistance train. It's just a stop. You can keep going all the way to death. Dementia is hugely associated with, um, insulin resistance, especially vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So certain types of dementia are def- they have more of a hereditary component, but man, insulin resistance, if you can keep it low, you really preserve your cognitive health. So it's important that we talk about talk about this because a lot of people like to pretend like they're just going to be fine forever. And I can tell you, you're not. If you don't change your lifestyle, you're going to need a geriatric physical therapist. You're going to need a lift chair. You're going to need a horror lift. You're going to increase your risk for falls and fractures beyond multiple medications, but you don't have to be. And Jesse, I met this guy once. I have to tell this story. In home care, geriatric physical therapy, uh, he was in his mid seventies and I was going in for an evaluation He'd had a couple amputations because of diabetes. He'd lost a few toes. He lost uh, like the metatarsals on one foot. He was pretty much wheelchair bound. And I took a deep breath and I go, oh my gosh, his medication reconciliation is going to take like an hour because he's probably on so many medications. He was not on one diabetes medication. I said, what in the world is going on with you? You have amputations from diabetes. Why are you not on any diabetes medications? He goes, I told him I wasn't going to lose my leg. And I changed my diet. And so he adopted a low-carb diet and an intermittent fasting lifestyle, and he saved his leg. But what if he had done that 10 years sooner? He'd probably be walking. 
you know, so it's never too late. Even if you've already had amputations, you can still reverse your diabetes, but don't do it before it's too late. And I always talk about part of the challenge with all this is that doctors are typically looking at blood glucose and the body is compensating by making more insulin as we become more insulin resistance, insulin resistant for a number of years. This can be 10, 20 years. Yeah. So the body's making more and more, keeping your blood sugar at bay. So if your doctor's checking that, it can look like everything's good. And maybe you're developing other symptoms, likely as you're developing, you know, further along the disease continuum, but maybe you're pushing those aside, just saying this is part of getting older. And then you get to the point where insulin can't keep blood glucose at bay anymore. And it just explodes basically in the body and you get diagnosed with type two diabetes. And you're again, 10, 20 years down the road when you could have been taking care of this so much earlier on and preventing. Yeah, that's the key. And the craft test, have you talked about that on the show yet? Not yet. Okay. That's a really good test for insulin resistance. Um, you can YouTube craft test. There's a doctor on there that explains it really well. It's similar to an oral glucose tolerance test, which is where you take a bolus of like 75 grams of glucose, which is disgusting. I know, but if you're really interested to know if you have insulin resistance, this is probably the best test to do. And then you test your blood glucose at 30, 60, 30, 30 minute fasting, 30 minutes, 60 minutes, two hours and three hours. So that tells you your glucose curve, right? But if we want to know your insulin resistance risk, we also want to check insulin. So a craft test, K-R-A-F-T, is you take that bolus of glucose and then you check your insulin and glucose fasted. You check it at 30 minutes, 60 minutes, two hours and three hours, and you get a glucose curve, but then you also get an insulin curve. And so you can see if your insulin is way elevated or if it stays elevated for a long time, that's pre-diabetic before you're pre-diabetic, essentially. So I think that's a really excellent test. Just getting a fasting insulin test is beneficial. We sell those directly through our website, depending on like a few states have um, regulations. But I started doing that because people would come to me and they'd be like, I went to my doctor to get a fasting insulin test and they looked at me like I had two heads. And then there's one response is like, I talked to my, my, uh, my friend who's an endocrinologist and, you know, he said that they only check fasting insulin. This is like my, my doctor voice, you know, <laughs> he said we only check fasting insulin if someone's type two diabetic. Um, and you know, even there's a stigma about these continuous glucose monitors. One of my members uh, is a nurse and she's lost 75 pounds and she was talking about her continuous glucose monitor at work. And one of the doctors is like, why are you checking your glucose? You're not diabetic. And she's like, well, cause I don't want to be diabetic, you know? Um, and so I think that is a really big thing that these, that doctors, um, really need to learn about the powers of checking insulin. And Dr. Robert Lustig in his book, Metabolical, he's like, please, please give a copy of this book to your physician. They need to know this information because they're not learning it in school. Because let's be honest, disease prevention saves a lot of money. Disease prevention saves a lot of money for the patient, but it costs a lot of profits for pharmaceutical companies, for physicians, for hospitals, for big food companies. Prevention does not sell. That's why it's not covered by, you know, most insurance companies. That's why it takes a grassroots effort from people like me and you to bring this real evidence-based information to the public because their doctors aren't doing it because the doctors aren't being taught that in school because the medical like education is really about diagnose and treat with a prescription not necessarily how do we fix the root cause problem unless they're going on to like functional medicine schools or other continuing education programs, which are out there. So yeah, I think a big barrier to treating insulin resistance is awareness of the con condition in the first place and how preventable it is and how reversible it is. And recognizing that there's a lot in our environment that goes against what I'm saying. So you have to kind of be you got to you have to learn how to be okay with being the outlier in your family or your community you have to be i like to say be the the thermos like the thermostat in the room not the thermometer you set the temperature of how you're going to act what you're going to eat when you're going to bed how you're going to move and everyone else can follow suit 
but don't be the thermometer in the room. Be like, Hey, you know, do you want to drink right now? Like, no, I don't want to drink right now. Thank you very much. Do you want that extra piece of, no, I don't want that extra. Like don't blend in, like stand out, figure out what you want and then do it. So be the thermostat, not the thermometer. Cause this stuff, these lifestyle changes, they are not a quick fix. They're not. And so I think that's, that's the hard sell on what I do. <sighs> Getting people to change their thoughts and change their behaviors is a lot harder than selling them a weight loss pill. I'm like, here, here's some Ozempic. Take it for six weeks. Take it for eight weeks. Give me thousands of dollars, you know, but I'm not actually going to change you. I'm not, I'm not actually going to tell you how to keep the weight off. I'm just going to help you lose it. You might feel miserable along the way because you're going to be like super full. So you can't eat anything. So you're not going to have any energy and you're going to lose a lot of strength but here's a pill to solve your problem. It's like, no, we have to get out of that mindset in medicine. All right. We've gone over the diet piece, but I want to make sure we get really practical, make sure that's fully hashed out for people. So say somebody's eating a typical type diet right now, wherever yeah. they're at along their diet continuum. I think what you said, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, but we start with protein and we want to have, is it a gram per pound of ideal body weight? Correct. Yep. So, okay, so we want to start with that as our base. Yep. And then depending on how active we are, we fit our carbs in. If we're a more active person, we can have more carbs and then we're going to bring down the fat. Or if we're less active, we're going to have more fat, less carbs. Yep. Let's get really practical with how, what that looks like for somebody. So you talked about before Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, who has been on the show a couple of times and her mentor, Dr. Don Lehman, who did the research that supports that protein, um, that, that bolus of protein first thing in the morning. And, and like you said, we have that at least 30 grams ideally with each meal. Yep. So let's take it all the way to the beginning for somebody first meal of the day, we're going to have at least 30 grams of protein. And how do we begin to, and of course it's going to be different. Like we said, depending on how active the person is, but let's, let's give people the lay of the land of what it would look like to eat throughout the day. Low carb, mm -hmm. trying to fix insulin resistance. Perfect. Okay. So I think a great first meal is eggs. So if you're doing maybe like four eggs, that's going to get you close to the 30 grams of protein. Maybe a couple pieces of bacon on the side or like a, a sausage on the side or some cheese on top. That's going to get you past Maybe you put some protein in your coffee, like 10 grams of protein in your coffee that helps boost it up. Now, if you want to add some carbohydrates to that, you could maybe put some beans on the side. I love doing like broccoli um, or like leftover roasted vegetables in my eggs, but that's pretty much all you need. If you want to add some carbohydrates, add some, you know, I like, we, I love making homemade sourdough bread. So I might have like half a slice of homemade sourdough bread with my eggs, um, have it at the end of the meal. So food order does matter. At each meal, I want you to think about having your non-starchy vegetables first, then your protein and fat, and then the starches or whatever sugar you're having. Another great example there, Jesse, would be like a cup of blackberries or you know, a cup of mixed berries. Blackberries, raspberries, and strawberries are going to be the highest in fiber, the lowest in sugar compared to blueberries. Maybe you want some avocado on the side for some healthy fats. So some sort of egg scramble, maybe some berries on the side. That's a great first meal. Now, when you're thinking about your next two meals, obviously I eat meat. So if you're a vegan or a vegetarian, you have to get creative and you're probably going to need a branch chain amino, amino acid supplement to get the proper amount of leucine to trigger that muscle protein synthesis. But five to six ounces of meat in general is a good estimate. So in cooked meat, you can estimate there's about seven grams of protein per ounce of cooked meat, right? So seven times five, what is that? 35? Yeah. Okay. So seven times five, 35. So five ounces of like rotisserie chicken breast, for example, weigh it out, measure it out until you get used to it. But a lot of people are having like three ounces of chicken. It's like, you're close. It's not that far off. So maybe you have some rotisserie chicken breast, um, heat up some, I like a, like a little pea bowl. So I'll do like three quarters of a cup of peas and I'll heat those up and I'll put some chicken in. And then I'm going to put some, like an eighth of a cup of walnuts in, and maybe, um, an eighth of a cup of feta cheese. in. um, sometimes I'll do like beans in there as well, like garbanzo beans, maybe 
quarter cup of those. So you're getting your protein, right, with the chicken. You're getting your healthy fats from the walnuts and the avocado, maybe some cheese, shredded cheese, feta cheese, whatever you want. And then you have a lot of fiber from the peas and the walnuts. So think protein, fat, fiber, or fiber, I don't know, however you want to think. I think protein, fat, fiber is the easiest, easiest way to say it. Um, so then at dinner, for example, maybe you have, if you're used to having spaghetti, right? Let's change that a little bit. Instead of having a bunch of noodles on the bottom from white pasta, change your pasta source. We use the bonds of chickpea pasta. So it's higher in protein, higher in fiber, um, a much lower blood glucose response. You still want to watch the portions. So maybe I'm having like three quarters of a cup of cooked pasta and I'm loading it up with the meat sauce. And then I put some, you know, more Parmesan or shredded cheese on top, depending on your calorie goals. That's the thing, Jesse. It's like if your goal is to gain weight or your goal is to lose weight, it's not that much of a different approach. You just adjust your portion sizes for the calories, but you still want to eat in a way that keeps insulin low so that the, the, the mass that you're putting on or taking off is healthy, like is healthy. So either we're losing fat or we're gaining muscle. So we want to eat this way regardless. So for dessert, if you want dessert, I would do like a chocolate peanut butter cup that you can make with, um, coconut oil and some peanut butter and baker, like unsweetened baker's chocolate, a little cocoa powder, a drop of stevia. You put them in these mini like candy cups, like the mini muffins, sprinkle some salt on top. And that's a really delicious like meal ender. If you want to have dessert, something like that. So notice I didn't say any snacks, but if you want some snacks, what I typically recommend, if people are really feeling like they need a snack, it's usually because they're under eating at their meals. And so I say, whatever typical snack you're going to have, tack it onto the meal, like a piece of string cheese or a hard boiled egg. All of those would be really good to add to that lunch to up the protein content. Like if you want a protein bar, get one that has low added sugar. Um, if people are really trying to gain muscle mass, I recommend a protein shake like right after working out, ideally. Another little hack is if you're doing intense exercise, again, you can tolerate more carbs. You want to replenish the muscle glycogen stores. That was a mistake I was making for a long time. I was trying to get back into running. I felt gassed at every workout. I'm like, oh my gosh, like I'm too young for this. <laughs> I'm too young to feel this way. Um, and so I, I started increasing my carbohydrate, my carbs a little bit at each meal and then refueling after exercise properly. And that helped a lot. So having some sort of protein shake, maybe you put some oats in there, maybe some pumpkin seeds. So where's my protein? Where's my fat? Where's my fiber? Think about that in every single meal focusing first on getting 30 grams of protein per meal, that's going to really set you up for long-term weight loss and maintenance success. And Jesse, there's been really good studies that have compared different dietary approaches for when you're losing weight, how do we preserve as much lean muscle mass as possible? And the high protein diet wins hands down. It wins over the low fat diet. It wins over the low carb diet. It wins over the low calorie diet. So what I like to say is, yes, we want an energy deficit over the long term, but we don't want a protein deficit. So that's how, that's how like a regular day of eating might look. And there's so many great options and there's so many simple swaps. Like if you like yogurt for breakfast, fantastic. But instead of getting the Yoplait stuff with like 12 grams of added sugar, get the full fat Chobani or whatever your fat goals are, get some high quality Greek yogurt put some, a couple drops of stevia in there, mix in some berries, maybe put some vanilla in, make your own flavored yogurt. You've already increased the protein content. So I think if you're already doing smoothies and you're doing almond milk, put in the fair life milk because it's has a ton more protein in it. You're going to be upping your protein content. So just thinking about what am I eating right now? How can I change just a little bit at a time? Like what's a minor tweak that I can make what pasta am I having? How can I optimize the pasta? What pasta sauce am I having? There's so much added sugar in a lot of spaghetti sauces. Choose a, choose a brand that doesn't have the added sugar. So it's not so much like an overhaul of your diet, but like these little micro changes over time that really add up.
You've talked about stevia a couple times. I think it's stevia and monk fruit. Those are the two sweeteners that you use. Yeah, correct? that's correct. Um, that study came out on erythritol. I really respect Dr. Peter Atia. Uh, it was a February of 23 and he kind of poo pooed the study, but in general, I think erythritol, erythritol causes a lot of GI side effects, a lot of gas, bloating, those kinds of things. So monk fruit and stevia don't typically cause those. And so it's like, well, let's just stick with those instead. Sometimes for baking, I'll use allulose, but stevia and monk fruit are my typical go-tos. I usually use the sweet leaf stevia drops. Like hot chocolate is a great example, Jesse. Like most people are using the powdered things from the store. You can make such good hot chocolate that's high in protein with a fair life milk, some cocoa powder, a couple drops of stevia. You can put um, some cinnamon in it to make it really good. But those are the types of little simple swaps that we want to start encouraging people to make to reduce their sugar intake. All right. So we've gone over the diet quite in detail here. As somebody adopts a low carb diet, again, with the goal of preventing or reversing insulin resistance, any specific supplements that you recommend to people? Yeah. Creatine would be one. Um, I think creatine, especially when you're trying to build muscle, can be really beneficial. I personally use about five grams a day, especially on my workout days. For people that don't eat fatty fish a couple times a week, um, some sort of omega-3 fatty acid can be good. You want to be careful about I, I typically recommend like the cold press kind or like the algae because you hear about some of them going rancid and there's issues there. So a really clean omega-3 fatty acid supplementation can be good. Branch chain amino acids can be a good supplement, especially if people aren't eating a lot of protein or if they're plant-based or if they're vegan or they're, veg or they're veg vegetarian because there's just... Animal-based products are a higher quality of protein because they have a higher amount of the essential amino acids, leucine being one of them. So a branch chain amino acid supplement might be good to consider. I always say run any supplement by your physician. I'm, I'm a physical therapist. I don't have the scope of practice to be able to pre prescribe medications, give supplements, but I can make those general recommendations and then say run it by your physician. All right. So we talked about having three meals a day the upping of the protein. If you're going to have snacks, ideally pair it with the meal at the end of the meal. For somebody that wants to add in intermittent fasting, how do you recommend they begin? Great question. So uh, I think Dr. Fung wrote in one of his books, The Complete Guide to Fasting. He said, you know, there's two methods to fasting. You can dip your toe in or you can just jump in. I think he recommends just jumping in. I prefer the tipping of the tipping the toe in method. Just from a psychological standpoint, I work mostly with women. I think we come with a host of other mental and emotional issues that, I don't know, maybe maybe men don't have to deal with when they're fasting. But, um, you know, a lot of women have a history of an eating disorder, some sort. I've had, I had exercise bulimia in high school, which is where, like, I exercised off anything that I ate. I lost my period for 10 months. A third of the girls in our high school class had some sort of eating disorder. So I'm very sensitive to that. And that's why I really recommend starting with a 12-hour fast. But if you want to progress past that, I would say do three meals within a like a 10-hour eating window and then compress it down to two meals and a high-protein snack. So that's really where we're getting into the 16-8. You're fasting for 16 hours. You're eating for eight hours a day. Maybe your first meal is at like 10, your last meal is at 6. You can still do three meals a day in that schedule as well. But a lot of people like the two meals and one snack just for calorie control. And then that's kind of a nice place for people to stay throughout their weight loss journey with sprinkling in some longer fasts to either offset a holiday like, we, you know, at the time of this recording, it was just Thanksgiving. So maybe you want to do a longer fast to kind of compensate for any overeating that happened. Um, autophagy is fantastic. That's going to kick in after about eight hours of a, of a clean fast. I don't know about you, but I think the the leaner I am, the harder fasting is for me. So if people have a lot of weight to lose, fasting is going to probably be easier for them, especially once they're fat adapted. So I recommend kind of a lower carb diet for a few weeks, maybe a couple months, and then going into the fasting. It's just going to be more comfortable that way. But um, you can do longer fasting. You know, one meal a day, for example, is kind of a nice reset amount, but be sure that that meal is portion controlled. Cause if you're eating, you know, 2000 calories in one meal, you're not going to be losing any weight. So, 
Um, I think that's important to keep it calorie controlled, portion controlled, 500 to 600 calories. But that to me is not going to fuel your body long term. One meal a day does not, pro- that's not just, it's just not good for your muscle mass long term. So I think that that's a strategy that we can sprinkle in as needed for a reset or a plateau buster. But on a normal day to day basis, I really like to see people fueling their bodies because from my experience with coaching, from my personal experience, you're going to have a lot less rebound eating if you're having those consistent meal times. All right, let's move into exercise. So for somebody that wants to use this as a tool specifically in the insulin resistance realm, what types, how often? Let's really get into it. Okay, the first thing I recommend is walking after meals, especially a high carb meal. Um, If you wear a continuous glucose monitor, you'll see the power of this in action. So if you can go for a walk, dance, do the stairs, whatever it is, move your body immediately after a meal. 10 minutes, 20 minutes, even if it's just five, any movement is better than none. Because remember when you're moving, when you're, when you have muscle demand for glucose, the GLUT4 transporters will be, will go from inside the cell to the cell membrane. So that glucose can come in so that insulin, less insulin is needed to move those GLUT4 transporters because they're there. And that's why, again, eating carbohydrates within 30 minutes of your workout, I call that the golden window for carbohydrates. The GLUT4 transporters are already there from exercise. What carbohydrates you eat will be shunted into the cells without the need for insulin within about 30 minutes of your meal. And that's why I've gotten very strategic with adding like oats in my smoothie after I exercise to replenish my muscle glycogen without the insulin spike. So I think timing the walk after your meals research really has done good. There's good research behind if you're going to walk for 30 minutes, is it better to do it in 10, you know, three 10 minute walks after your meals or in one 30 minute walk. And from a blood sugar lowering standpoint, which will also lower insulin, it's better to break it up throughout the day. Um, I think the second thing from a movement stand, like I'm using a standing desk right now. I have four hours of meeting today and I'm going to be standing for four hours instead of sitting for four hours. So getting up, moving your body regularly, regularly throughout the day. That's where we start. We do not start with signing up for some crazy eight or 12 week program. That's going to be way too intense for your body. Gentle, simple things is what, what, what we should be starting with. So the second thing is strength training. And I really recommend at least two days a week of moderate to high intensity strength training for all major muscle groups. Now let's break that down practically. As a physical therapist, my pet peeve was walking into the gym and seeing somebody sitting down with like three pound ankle weights on their ankles and doing like these little seated leg kicks. And my favorite quote from geriatric rehab is the only time that we should be having somebody kick their leg from a seated position is if their goal is to kick a ball from a seated position. The caveat there is joint replacements. I do think that there are some benefits. Like if you've had a knee replacement or a hip replacement, yes, do those, do those knee kicks, get the blood flowing. But in general, we are underdosing ourselves and our patients with strength training. Moderate intensity for very simple terms means you can't do one more repetition with good form after 12 to 15 repetitions, Eh, maybe down to 10. So 10 to 15, we can call that moderate to high intensity, or excuse me, moderate. Five to 10 repetitions to fatigue, which means you can't do another one without good form. That's high intensity. So if we're strength training all major muscle groups, at a moderate to high intensity, two days a week. There's two, there's two primary ways that you can do that. You can either do a total body workout two days a week. So we're talking upper body, core, lower body. Functional movements are always going to be more efficient and better. Things like squats, lunges, push-ups, pull-ups, planks, those, those exercises that engage more than mon- one muscle group instead of like a single bicep curl, man, that's going to take you a long time if you're, if you're just working one muscle at a time to get an effective workout in. So um, compound movements are going to be best for those uh, total body days. 
You could also split it. Maybe you have less time and you need to be um, 20 minute workouts. So you, Monday you could do arms and core. Tuesday you could do legs. Wednesday can be your break. Thursday you can do arms and core again. And Friday you can do legs. I don't care if people split it up or if they do two full body workouts two days a week, but it's got to get done. And it is so beneficial for your joints, your insulin sensitivity, your mobility. But people are intimidated to start. And for that, I say invest in a trainer. If you do not, if you're not comfortable in the gym, if you don't know what to do at home, invest in a trainer. It's going to be a few hundred dollars, yes, but think about the long-term payoff. We always think about the short-term cost, not the long-term return on investment. Um, One of my members uh, calculated she, I don't know how she did it, but she calculated how much is it going to cost me to go into a retirement obese? And it was $1,200 a month, Jesse, from like medications, from lost income, from all, all sorts of factors went into that. $1,200 a month is what it was going to cost her to be obese. So she was, yeah, I'm going to invest in myself now so that I can save that money then. Um, so again, we have to protect our joints. And in order to protect our joints, our muscles need to be strong. If your muscles aren't strong, your joints have to do more work. So people with joint pain, for example, they're like, oh, I don't know what to do. Like, ah, oh, it just hurts so much. It's like, well, if you don't move, it's going to continue to hurt worse. And there are experts out there that can help you learn how to move within a range of motion that feels good to you. Um, so investing in a trainer, investing in yourself, we have a gym downstairs now that we moved to the farm, like a, it's called a Marcy Smith machine. And I can do anything that I want to do on it that I could do at the gym. So that allows me to be more consistent than driving half an hour to go to the gym. Not going to happen. <laughs> um, so then from there, I think talking about zone two cardio can be really beneficial. There's five cardiovascular zones. Cardiovascular just means heart, like your heart your blood vessel. A zone one is very, very easy. Zone five is very hard, all out sprints. Um, zone two is kind of like a light, mod, like a light to moderate uh, exertion level. And research has shown that that's really good for our energy production. That's good for our mitochondria. It's great for stress management. So if you're reading the guidelines, Jesse, what you're going to see is 150 to 300 minutes of quote unquote moderate activity cardiovascular activity each week, right? So half an hour a day. That's a lot for people like that. I don't know if you've tried to reach the, like reach those guidelines. That's a lot. Um, but at a minimum, I think that's a great, it's a great goal, but you can do walking, elliptical, swimming, biking, whatever you want to do. Cardiovascular exercise is important because that works your heart muscle. So the, a lot of like the resistance training, that's not good. To, that's not going to get your heart rate up enough to get those cardiovascular benefits. Um, so both are important. Um, high, high intensity exercise is more like zone three, four, and five. That's like interval training, high intensity interval training. It's great. We don't want to overdo that because that will kind of spike our cortisol more than what, what should be desired. So what I see a lot of women doing is just walking. (laughs) I'm doing pickleball. I'm walking. It's like, okay, great. But where's the strength training? So I think that that's why the strength training should be the cornerstone. And then from there, you can fit in the cardio around your strength training days. But Dr. Ben Bickman uh, wrote a great book called Why We Get Sick on Insulin Resistance. And he had a quote in there that said, you know, minute for minute, resistance training is better for lowering insulin resistance than cardio. And so there's just ample research supporting the benefits, the efficacy of a good, a well-designed strength training program. So hire a trainer, get, get yourself comfortable in the gym. I don't care if you don't like to do it. That doesn't matter. Your future self wants you to do this. Your future self wants you to be able to get up from the chair without a lift. Your future self wants you to be able to play with your grandkids on the floor so and get up safely. Your future self wants you to be able to get up if you fall or not fall in the first place. And that requires good muscle strength. Now, the last type of exercise is flexibility and balance training. Also important, that mobility work. And so what I like to do personally is stretch at night, like the first 10 minutes that I'm watching TV with my husband instead of crashing on the couch, I stretch. And so if you can work that flexibility and mobility work into your routine, your just daily routine, 
I think that's a lot better than me like, okay, I have to do this one hour yoga class every single Tuesday, which is great. Great for stress management. Great. I'm not anti that, but I think the mobility work is something that can and should be done on a daily basis. I took notice when you're talking about zone two, you didn't mention the fact that these exercises are burning calories. Oh no. So let's, because that again is a common myth. People think exercise, the whole purpose is to burn calories. And again, I want to bring calories as a whole into the conversation too. We've touched on it a couple of times in the diet realm. So talk about why when it comes to exercise, that isn't the goal. And then how you feel about calories as a whole. Okay. So when it comes to calories, I think no one has broken it down the myths better than Dr. Jason Fung in his book, The Obesity Code. He goes through the calorie myth. He, he breaks down like four or five things. And one of them being that we have assumed that calories in and calories out are independent variables. And if I eat 250 less calories a day and I burn 250 more calories a day, I will be at a net 500 calorie deficit and lose one pound a week. Anyone who's tried that knows that that is garbage and it doesn't work. At least it doesn't work long term. The reason is because calories in and calories out are dependent variables. If you reduce your calories in, say for example, you're taking Ozempic to reduce your appetite, tell me that you're not reducing your calories out. Tell me that you're not tempted to park closer at the store or skip a workout because you don't have the energy. When your body is so smart, when you reduce calories in, you reduce calories out. You reduce your exercise and your non-exercise activity thermogenesis or your NEAT, which is part of that overall metabolic rate. When you increase your calories out, you're going to increase your calories in. So I don't know if there's any runners out here, but I'm getting back into running and especially with that longer distance endurance exercise that will trigger your hunger hormones after a run, after you exercise, you're going to want to eat. So calories in and calories out, they are dependent variables. The other thing is what about the hormonal benefits of exercise? So we know there's research on sumo wrestlers, for example, and when they are exercising hours and hours a day, they're metabolically healthy. When they stop, they're not. And why that is, one reason is the hormone adiponectin uh, will increase when you're exercising, and that will, that will encourage your fat to be stored where it should be stored in your subcutaneous stores, which is under your skin, not your visceral stores, which is like crowding all of those inner organs. So exercise is so good. Uh, Dr. Fung says, you know, exercise is like brushing your teeth. It's good for you and should be done every day. Just don't expect to lose weight. Uh, fact, absolute fact. So the other thing about exercise, Jesse, is it's a mood booster. It increases your endorphins. It increases your self-confidence in yourself to show up and follow through. It's a, it's a great way to uh, express stress in a healthy way to get that cortisol going, to get the, to get the blood sugars that have been raised from the stress, like the cortisol, get those into your cells without the insulin. So I never think about how many calories am I burning because it doesn't matter. It just... It just doesn't matter. What matters more is how am I sleeping? How's my stress level? How's my nutrition? How's my general exercise? You know, there, there's, just, there's just not a lot of benefit to focusing on how many calories did I burn in this workout. And so I don't like to focus on things that don't matter. <laughs> and so if that doesn't matter, I'm not going to focus on it. Plus, if you focus on it, you're going to bias your workout towards cardio. Because when you're doing your bench press, when you're doing your push-ups, when you're doing your squats, there's not a calorie counter on the squat machine saying how many calories you burn. And if there is, it's not very many. But if you're walking, you can see that little calorie number go up and up and up. That was strategically designed to keep you on the treadmill longer so you can reach your calorie goal. Um, so calories, they're a unit of measurement created by man for practical purposes, right? Calories do matter. But what matters a lot more is the hormonal impact and overall hormonal balance from your lifestyle. So I'm much more concerned about that 
than like the strict number of calories that someone's eating. If someone's at a plateau, I might look at their overall calorie intake, but I'm also going to be looking at their stress and their sleep and the quality of those calories. As you're going through exercise, the other area I wanted you to expand on, you mentioned building muscle will make us more insulin sensitive, which ties into our whole thesis of this conversation, insulin resistance. So talk about how that works. Yeah. So I like to describe muscle as a garage um, and glucose as the cars. The bigger garage you have, the more cars you can fit into that garage. People with low levels of muscle mass can be very insulin resistant. People with large levels of muscle mass, they just have more room to put glucose after a high carb meal before it gets shunted into the fat stores. So I think that's pr the primary reason, but then the other reason is surface area, right? So not only like more room to store the car, but think of like a big garage, like I'm looking at my garage right now, there's like an outlet on it. Let's pretend like there's a lot of outlets on the garage. All of those can be receptors for insulin. So there's more receptors so that you can be more insulin sensitive just for the sheer number that you can have more receptors on the cell. All right. I think a good place for us to end on somebody that's tuned into this point, they're saying to themselves, I'm somewhere along this insulin resistance continuum. I'm motivated now to correct this. You've given me the tools and strategies. If I begin to implement and work towards this, how quickly can I start to lose weight and reverse insulin resistance? Yeah. Well, it depends on um, how quote unquote extreme you want to go with things. My way is slow, but it is sustainable. If you want fast results, cut your carbs down to 20 to 50 grams a day, eat one meal a day but that's not going to last very long. So with my way, a very typical rate of weight loss once they once they master the mindset part. So I don't, you know, if you're doing like the, the daily mindset routine, the weekly accountability meeting, um, the water and the sleep, if you're still in those phases, you probably won't see a lot of weight loss, but you're going to start to feel a lot better. You're going to start to feel a lot more self-empowered. But once you get to the strategies, about a half a pound a week is a really good rate. So give yourself a month or two maybe to get like your head around things. In our program, we actually have like an eight-week program. And we don't really even start implementation until mindset in week five. And so like we kind of view the first eight weeks as a learning phase anyways. Some people like to like get a jump start on it, others not. But it's a slow process. And what I tell people is like the, the longest way to your destination is to take all the shortcuts. Just like your mom always said growing up, like do it right the first time and you won't have to go back and redo it. So even though it might be a little bit slower up front, you're laying the groundwork for success so that this beautiful healthy habits house that you're building actually stays. You know, it's like build your house on the rock and it's not going to fall down. But if you just throw things, you know, building it on sand, when the storm comes, when you get stressed, when your family's in town, you don't have the resilience or the problem solving capabilities to deal with things. And that's when people get off track for weeks or months when they don't have that foundation in, in place. And so my approach, once you actually start changing your diet, a half a pound a week, that's awesome progress. And I think that goes against what a lot of people have learned and been reinforced from like Weight Watchers meetings or, you know, ex like more extended fasting programs with that fast weight loss because everyone wants that. And I would say that's because they're focused on the wrong goal. They're focused on losing weight instead of losing weight and keeping it off. That's the real goal. And that requires a different strategy from the get-go. All right, Morgan, we gave people here a ton to dig into and the strategies, again, that they need to get started and to work through this. We're going to link up your YouTube channel, your social media, your website, everything in the show notes. And I just want to thank you for coming on. This was great. Thank you, Jesse. It's been an honor to be on your show. Now that you're done with Morgan, you're going to want to stick around here and catch my chat with Dr. Lustig. He's got even more to share about insulin resistance. You don't want to miss this. I'll see you over there. Ultimately, it's not what's in the food. It's what's been done to the food that matters. Everything fructose does to the mitochondria is designed